Copy. By Gwynifar Roller. Read by Rebecca Carmichael. The worst Christmas of my life was the year we moved into our new house on Market Street. It was also the year I learned to believe in miracles. My parents had just moved us into the dilapidated mansion that would consume our lives for the next 16 or so years. We were living in the only room that had had the plaster repaired, the walls painted, the wiring updated, and the floors finished on the second floor. It would eventually become my bedroom. Amid the scaffolding and boxes and drop clothes, my mother, who was way past her wit's end with the magnitude of the move, the house, and now caring for my grandparents, who had just moved into our old house six blocks away, decided that the one thing she really wanted in order to enjoy her new house was a Christmas tree worthy of the space. She had a living room with 14-foot ceilings somewhere in all this mess, and she wanted the grandest Christmas tree she could have to fill the space. No one got into Christmas like my mother. In the years to come, she would drape the banister and garland, hang terracotta angels and red ribbons from the sconces, and make eight-course Christmas dinners beyond description. Did I mention she was Jewish? So Mommy got her Christmas tree. Enough space was cleared in the debris to put out the poncetta, tree skirt, and somehow at least one box of ornaments was located. I had to admit that she was right. In all that chaos, we did need something normal, something special to focus on instead of the daily arguments about not being able to find anything and then discovering that your best clothing was covered in plaster dust and ruined beyond repair. But no matter how stressed out we were, with tradesmen wandering in and out all the time, and the painter who had practically moved in with us for most of the fall and winter, my dog, Copy, the sweetest beagle who has ever lived, was probably the happiest dog on the planet, because the new house came with a six-foot chain-link fence around the yard, and after four years at the end of a hundred-foot chain, he was free to wander the yard and run the perimeter all day and all night. Copy had been my third birthday present. I did not know it at the time, but apparently my parents thought a lot about this potential gift. My father believed strongly that children should grow up with a dog. My mother, who did not grow up with a dog, was adamant that if they got me a puppy, the puppy would die and then they were going to have to explain death to a three-year-old. Obviously, that was not something she wanted to do. In one of the rare instances that I know of, my father actually won an argument. So, on my third birthday, I had a strawberry shortcake birthday cake with Shannon Ingram from down the street, and a very sweet, tiny, beagle puppy appeared to be my friend. Daddy's favorite movie in the world is Disney's The Fox and the Hound. He wanted to name the puppy Copper for the beagle in the cartoon. I insisted, in my already very strong-willed three-year-old way, that he would be called Copy, not Copper, because Copy was an original name. So Copy was enjoying his newfound freedom and was probably happier about all the changes in our living situation than anyone else in the family. We became a lot closer during that time. We had always been very good friends, but his freedom and ability to come play with me in the yard anywhere I went meant we had more opportunities to get into mischief together. And my parents were very preoccupied with the house, which meant we were left to our own devices more than we ever were before. I decided that year that I was old enough to buy holiday gifts for people myself. At the top of my list was, of course, copy. Since we had moved, he needed new dog tags with updated information. I found an ad in the Sunday Parade magazine for engraved dog tags. You could get all sorts of shapes and sizes. After much deliberation, I settled on a dog bone-shaped tag and began saving my allowance towards the $6.50 engraving that would cost plus the $3.50 shipping and handling. I had to plan a long way in advance to have time for it to arrive before the holidays. Eventually, I had all the money assembled and got Mommy to write a check to the company for my $11. I had so carefully saved. I think she was paying for things with quarters and nickels for a couple of months after that. It arrived with four days to spare before the holiday. 
I was so excited. You would have thought the gift was for me. Next came the even better part, wrapping it. Oh my God. That kept me busy for a couple of hours as I searched for the perfect box, which turned out to be an empty matchbox from the matches from Elijah's restaurant. I settled on a royal blue wrapping paper and a big, bright red bow that was as big as the box. It was so beautiful, and I felt so grown up to have done this myself. It was lightweight enough that I could actually rest it on one of the branches of the Christmas tree like a decoration, which just added to my little girl's delight at the whole situation. My father had always done Christmas shopping on Christmas Eve, where other people plan for weeks, if not months, and start the day after Thanksgiving. My father, very calmly, sallies forth on the 24th of December, and in the matter of two hours, does it all. This particular year, my normally very quiet, soft-spoken daddy came bursting through the back door with the mid-afternoon of Christmas Eve, bellowing for my mother and dropping bags on the floor. Diana! Diana! The dog's out! The door was open! Diana! Mother came pounding down the stairs at a dead run. Kitty, go get his leash out on the drawer, she directed as she hurried past me and out the back door. Among the many points of irritation in the far-from-perfect circumstances of the new house was the problem of the garage door. There wasn't one. The garage is a lovely, red brick structure, completely removed from the house. It is the perfect environment in which to grow shiitake mushrooms. Damp and dark, with a concrete floor. At that time, it did not have a car door part of the garage. That was just open and exposed to the street. It would be about 12 years before my parents decided to allocate the funds to the particular home improvement project. For the time being, they were preoccupied with the ceiling that had just collapsed on part of the first floor. There was a shoddy particle board between the yard and the garage that was barely hanging on by a thread and didn't stay closed well. Eventually, we would work out a system with the screen door hooks to keep the garage door closed, and people would have to adjust their schedule to avoid getting stuck on the wrong side of the door. The door wasn't latched, or someone had unlatched it, and copy was out. If you have never spent time with a beagle, let me tell you a little about them. They're happiest with their nose on the ground, moving sort of like a vacuum cleaner in constant contact with the trail they're scenting. Once they have the scent, they begin this howling talking that is very hard on the human ear, but it lets the other dogs know in the pack and the hunter know that they have a scent they are following. Once they have a scent, it is like a switch has been thrown off in their brain and nothing else matters. Nothing. They will follow the scent to the end of the earth. Once they get there, they will have no idea where they are or how to get home. We searched till dark for him, calling till our voices were hoarse. Once it became too dark to see, Mommy sent Daddy back with a flashlight and a handful of dog food to try again. She called the police and filled a missing dog report. Of course, he didn't have his new dog tags because they were under the tree waiting for him. She called the vets in the phone book to ask if anyone had brought in a dog matching his description. It was Christmas Eve. Most vets' offices were closed. She left answering machine messages with his description and the detail that he didn't have his tags. I cried myself to sleep that night and decided that I would forego presents for Copy's safe return the next morning. I woke up convinced that Santa would have brought me back Copy and that he would be safe under the tree. I must have been the only child in the world upset to find a stack of presents wrapped with bows waiting for me. We spent Christmas morning driving around looking for Copy. We came home for lunch and then went out again looking for him some more. All I could think was poor Copy, alone, cold, without food and his tags were under the tree, waiting for him. I knew things were really bad on the 26th when Daddy suggested that maybe I might want to write a story about Copy's big adventure. No, I shook my head, thinking, you just told me you think he is dead. The 27th came and went, with more searching and no clues. This was the 1980s. Computers were just starting to be used to record keeping in a widespread way. But the internet and file sharing between government departments was still years away. The week between Christmas and New Year's, everyone's on a skeleton staff, so Mommy's missing dog report didn't get filtered through to everybody until the 28th. 
someone out at Atlantic Animal Hospital by landfall had brought in a beagle. Animal controlled, called to let us know. Damn it, Mommy cursed. I didn't call that one. It was so far away, I figured he wouldn't make it out there. Mommy warned me in the car on the way out there. Now, we need to be prepared for the possibility that it's not him. You don't want to get your hopes up too much. At the vet's office, they took us back to the kennel area and opened the cage door. It was a flattened version of Copy All Right, but he wouldn't come to me. He's pretty bad off, the lady told us. He can't walk. I grabbed him in a big hug and sobbed all over him while he licked my face. So our new house was on Market Street, also known as Highway 17 North, which is an incredibly busy road. Apparently, Copy was run over on Market Street on Christmas Eve, and the person who did it kept going. But the lady behind them saw what happened. She scooped up Copy and drove around to every vet in town until she found the only one that was open on Christmas Eve. And what is more, she guaranteed payment for his care. With a smashed pelvis, two fractured ribs, and emergency surgery that wasn't going to be cheap. But she said she did it anyway. My parents obviously paid Copy's bills, and the following week, when he was able to be moved, he came home with us to one of the most grateful families any dog had ever had. I never met the lady that scooped Copy off of Market Street, but she taught us to believe in the inherent goodness of people and that miracles really can happen. That Christmas, she saved more than a dog's life. Gwynefar fell in love with the magic of theater in the front row balcony of Thalian Hall on her fifth birthday. She considers herself very fortunate to have spent every weekend in the last 12 years in the audience watching her favorite performers ply their craft. Thank you all for the privilege. <laughs>